Hello again, family. I've decided to put together a presentation on smart cities and give an overview of what they are and try to clarify some of the concerns that I've heard from residents and people all over the country. Concerns are rising all over the country as governments start to bring in smart technologies to manage services. I get a constant stream of people reaching out to me with their fears about the implications of these initiatives and they're asking what can be done. Also, I've talked to city councillors who have said that some residents are in a panic about smart cities and 15 minute city initiatives. I hope that this video will give you some information about smart cities so that you can better understand what they are, what they entail, and how they may affect you. Smart cities have become a popular planning tool that theoretically attempts to improve the quality of life for its citizens with the stated goal of making daily living activities easily accessible while at the same time increasing energy efficiency and sustainability. Smart cities place a heavy reliance on internet connected digital technologies and it raises questions about its impact on individual privacy and autonomy. But what exactly are smart cities? The term can mean different things to different people depending on the context and who's using the term. In its full conceptualization, it refers to technology-driven cities using smart technology platforms with many interconnected technologies that manage city services. Conversely, the term can simply refer to cities utilizing standalone smart technologies such as smart traffic lights equipped with sensors, cameras, as well as smart urban planning practices. Here's a video that summarizes a smart city. The video was done by CNBC in 2017 and describes much of what we're seeing happening through various parts, over various parts of the world. Just how smart is your city? Chances are it's getting smarter by the year. Many governments around the globe are racing to infuse technology into just about every aspect of its city's operations. And I mean every part, including public transportation, IT connectivity, water and power supply, sanitation and solid waste management, efficient urban mobility, e-governance, and citizen participation. And it does this using every buzzword imaginable, from big data to the internet of things. So how does a smart city work? Let's look at three examples. Here in Singapore, the city-state might be the gold standard of the most extensive effort to collect data on daily living. The government is now deploying systems that can tell when people are smoking in prohibited zones or littering from high-rise housing. Singapore launched its own Smart Nation program in 2014 and will add more cameras like these so the government can effectively monitor crowd density, cleanliness of public spaces, and even the exact movement of every locally registered vehicle. Much of the data it's collecting will be fed into an online platform called Virtual Singapore that gives the government access to how the city is functioning in real time. It could help the government predict how crowds might react to an explosion in a shopping mall or how infectious disease might spread. Over in Dubai, more than 50 smart services from 22 government entities have been rolled out as part of the government's Smart Dubai initiative. Using the government-provided app Dubai Now, you can do things like pay a speeding ticket, which likely captured you on a public camera and then emailed you the ticket directly. You can also use the same app to pay your electric bill, call a taxi, track a package you sent to your friend, find the nearest ATM, renew your vehicle registration, track the visa status of a relative, and report a violation to the Dubai police. As you can see, some examples of smart city technology integrated into daily life would include things like smart utilities, smart homes, autonomous vehicles, smart hospitals, smart public transportation, smart traffic control. It should also be noted that much of the push for smart city technology is driven at the international level and is billed as necessary to bring in a so-called fourth industrial revolution, a term that was coined by the World Economic Forum years ago that envisions a world of interconnected smart technologies and artificial intelligence ushering in rapid and radical societal change in order to meet a net zero target and minimize one's carbon footprint on humanity. In 2017, the Trudeau government started the competition 
known as the Smart City Challenge. The government invited cities all across Canada to develop, quote, bold, ambitious ideas to improve the lives of their residents using data and connected technologies, end quote. Essentially, they were encouraging municipalities to collect data and use internet connected technologies to run services and cut energy usage. The first round of Smart City Challenges was launched in 2017. Over 225 municipalities applied. 75 million total in funding was awarded for energy and food projects, health awareness initiatives, and shared transportation methods in New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec, and Nunavut. The program is currently on hold now. Outside of this program, there was a number of smart city initiatives popping up across the country as these technologies also expanded globally. Mississauga, for example, has a smart city master plan with plans to use data and technology to improve every area of city life, including traffic, environment, education, and social services. Smart city plans are underway in Edmonton, Kitchener, Ottawa, and Deep Cove, British Columbia, which is starting a 15-minute city plan, which is closely associated with smart city initiatives and is sparking some concern amongst the surrounding vicinity. The graph on the screen is from the City of Edmonton. It is their proposal of the Smart City Framework, which they submitted to Infrastructure Canada as part of their proposal to the Smart Cities Challenge. One of the most advanced initiatives, however, was the Sidewalk Labs project, which proposed an integrated, technology-driven 12-acre community in downtown Toronto. The project was announced by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in 2017 in partnership with Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. It was cancelled in 2020, citing uncertainty due to the COVID pandemic. But there was also a lot of pushback from residents over this project. One of the board members, a former privacy commissioner, even resigned from the project because they weren't respecting a commitment to privacy protection. So why all the noise about smart cities? What are some of the concerns? In this video, I'm going to focus on two primary concerns from civil society when it comes to smart cities. The first is privacy and the second is autonomy. With respect to privacy and smart city technology, the greatest concern is the potential for increased tracking, surveillance, and data collection capabilities. Whether it is tracking real-time location, personal preferences, or behavioral patterns, this technology inherently raises a host of privacy risks and concerns. It's clear that in order for these technologies to be smart, they need data. The more data the technology has access to, the smarter it is. The bigger the city project, the bigger the data pool needs to be. The more data collected, the greater the risk to personal privacy. How that data is collected, processed, stored, and shared are all key privacy concerns. These concerns include how much and what kind of non-essential personal data is being collected and stored? Is the data identifiable? Where is the data being stored? Who has access to the data? How is that data handled and managed? What makes anxieties and concerns around privacy even greater is that people don't know what's being done with their data. They don't have direct access to the systems that collect their data, and they can't see how their data is being protected or not protected. This is exactly what Canada's federal, provincial, and territorial privacy commissioners warned about in a joint letter sent to the Minister of Infrastructure in 2018 when the government started the Smart City Challenge. Here's what the various commissioners said in their letters, quote, these smart city systems can be used to generate large amounts of data, which may include highly sensitive personal information. This data can enable privacy invasive activities such as surveillance or profiling and may entice communities and private sector partners to use the personal information 
for different purposes without consent, contrary to Canadian privacy laws and without public input. input. Such risks can compromise public trust, a key element for the success of any smart city initiative." End quote. They go on to urge the government to help ensure that government resources are not expended on initiatives that either infringe on the fundamental rights to privacy or risk failing because the public's confidence in the systems are lacking. When third-party private companies are involved in providing the technology or software, this introduces risks that this may also lead to surveillance capitalism. Experts agree that this is a key risk, and indeed this was an undercurrent of the privacy concerns around Toronto's Google-led Smart City project. It is understood that these concerns ultimately led to its downfall. The risk and some concerns around the security and abuse of data related to smart cities are actually real. For example, what seems like a convenience or a simple solution to solve a problem can be a door that allows access to the private information of citizens. The second primary concern is autonomy, and this flows from the concern about privacy and how data is collected and used. Privacy is a gateway to other charter protected rights meaning that once privacy erodes, it becomes easier to erode other rights and therefore leads to less freedom and less autonomy. For example, a smart city technology like electric autonomous vehicles with electric charge stations will likely replace gas-powered vehicles with the stated objective of cutting pollution and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. When we think of reduced autonomy, in something so simple as electric vehicles, one may argue that with the shift to electric vehicles in a smart city environment, there may be less vehicle options and choices. There may also be an expected reduction of car ownership simply arising from a policy that limits one's ability to charge vehicles at peak electricity hours or to travel at peak periods and to impose fines or fees for peak period use. Or let's say, for example, a city implements a smart power grid and smart meters for every home with the objective of energy conservation. That's a laudable goal. However, the risk of autonomy is that now there is the potential for limits to be put on the amount of electricity that you will use at peak periods, such as turning up the AC on a hot day or the heat on a cold day. With a smart meter, you may not be able to control, for example, whether you want to increase your AC or heat at a certain period because of limits put on your use by a smart meter. Or take smart fridges. They're connected to the internet. They are designed to be efficient, energy efficient and cut food waste. There are discussions of linking these devices to carbon footprint or consumption trackers which could share personal consumption choice information with the server and with third parties to monitor or discourage or prevent the consumption of carbon intensive products. As smart technologies become more ubiquitous, the impact on personal autonomy will follow, from, will follow as lawmakers seek to bring about changes to consumer behavior. They are brought in with the promise of added convenience and making the planet healthier but they can easily be used by those in power to enforce limits and restrict use to coerce changes in behaviors and choices, which will lead to net zero and carbon neutral economy. I'll talk to you a little bit more about net zero and carbon neutral economy within the context of smart cities in another video. Over time, if this is left unchecked, continual erosion of our autonomy becomes a massive threat to a free and democratic society. People who are concerned about the rise of 15-minute cities also have questions about how it's interconnected with smart cities. The main concerns that I'm hearing about 15-minute cities are always connected to restrictions of movement and personal autonomy. I will follow up with another video to discuss 15-minute cities and how they fit into the wider discussion of smart cities. I've discussed this issue of the rise of smart cities and their impact on society 
with academics, university professors uh, that focus on digital policy, and other civil liberty groups. Some of these individuals are for smart cities and some are skeptical. But the common ground is that they all agree that autonomy and privacy must be protected. There's also across the board agreement that the federal privacy and cybersecurity laws are woefully insufficient to protect Canadians in the current digital era. The rate of technology development is far outpacing the legislative protections. And while the government has a bill before Parliament to update digital privacy rules in the private sector, it has not updated the privacy legislation governing its own institutions, and this is very concerning. I also want to highlight that the concerns around privacy and autonomy are not just local. The Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CSIS, also has concerns. CSIS conducted a national security briefing on smart cities that outlines many key security concerns for governments, including the potential of hacking by foreign countries into our data. I've been discussing net zero and carbon neutral policies for years. However, it seems that people are more interested in these policies now than they were in the past because they're largely seeing how it's impacting on their lives currently. It is also reassuring to know that the Conservative Party of Canada, under our leader, the Honourable Pierre Paulia, is listening and understanding what's at stake if your privacy and autonomy are not protected. And that is why the Honourable Pierre Paulia and our team are unrelenting in ensuring that the government is accountable to the people and respects the fundamental freedoms of all Canadians. I hope that you found this video informative. There's so much more to share with you and to discuss about this very important topic. I will follow up with more information to share with you very soon, including a deeper dive into the security concerns around smart cities in my next video. Bye for now.